Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to manage vets consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session of The Bend. Um, Today's guest is, I guess, one of the most accomplished veterinary technicians in our profession. She has more letters behind her name than anybody I know, just about. This is uh, my friend, Melissa Serpinor. Melissa is an experienced uh, technician specialist. She uh, has worked in secondary and higher education industries. She uh, has worked in animal welfare, disaster medicine, uh, personal development of veterinary teams. That's kind of her her strong suit is education of veterinary teams. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Worcester State College and an associate's in science and veterinary technology from Becker College. She's an international speaker with a range of lectures from veterinary technician specialist topics, personal and professional development, leadership, and management. And she is here with me today. Her LVT, CVT, VTS, CFE, and CCFP. Did I get them all, Mel? You got them all. (laughs) Well, thanks for coming on. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your time today and uh, love to talk to somebody who's accomplished with as you in our profession, uh, because, you know, truthfully, all those accomplishments take a lot of bends in the road, right, to to accomplish. Um, you just don't get that stuff overnight. So I, I do want to to tell people how I met you, if that's OK. Yeah, that is fine. Yeah. So Melissa had written an article, I think maybe on DVM 360, one of the magazines about bullying, but she confessed to being the bully. And I was so impressed that it was incredibly vulnerable and brave of her to do that, that I just sent her a random email and said, wow, this is really a great article. And I'm so impressed that you did that. And, uh, you know, we messaged back and then the next thing you knew, we were meeting at a conference and we were both event partners members together. And we've been like hanging out at conferences ever since. So sometimes you can just randomly pick up the phone or shoot an email to somebody and meet a new good friend, uh, especially one as impressive as she is. So thanks for coming on, Mel. Um, I really appreciate it and all that you do for the profession, because that's uh, that was a tough confession, I think. Maybe it wasn't for you, but I was impressed with it. No, and and thank you, Deb, for having me, because this is uh, such an honor to be on the bend with you. Um, it was actually a tough uh, Deb Stone and I were working on that together, um, and she she kind of guided me towards that, and and it was it was a difficult thing, but I felt that it was important to say um, because I lecture on it all the time on how not to be a bully, and I feel like at that point, you know, it wasn't coming clean as much of I was exploring um, my past and how do I not feel like a fraud, I think more or less with everyone. And, you know, I was bullied on top of that too. So it was that article really a a big part of let me get better and do better. Um, And I really wanted that message to come out. And I can say on the other side of that though, is having someone um, as, as, as much as I admired you, from afar uh, for a long time. So to have you email me and say that was so brave and everything else, that meant the, the world to me. And it really, it, it meant so much to, I, that I felt like I did the right thing. Oh. Like that was the, the guiding moment to say, I did something right in that article to be able to have somebody of your stature come back out and say, 
thank you for that. And that yeah. was, that meant the world to me. And I think um, the second thing that meant the world to me during that time was when you actually were the person who pinned me at Vet Partners. Yes. And that was a, a shining moment for me. And I don't get choked up a lot. I can say those two, those two were very uh, choking up moments for me. So thank well, you for well, always being well. there. I'm honored that it, 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 you know, it's just, um, I believe calling out good stuff, you know, I, I always have. And when people do stuff like that, I think that a lot of times people go, oh, you know, that was really great. And I admire that, but they never make that move to say to that person, wow, you know what, mm -hmm. this was great. And, um, and I try to do that, you know, out there in the world and, because I want more of it, right? I want more bravery and I want more honesty and I want more examples of, of behavior that should happen because I do believe that we are influenced by the people around us and we need good influencers out there in the world. And I think that was a really seminal topic. I, you know, a lot of times we talk a lot about bullying and about uh, biases and stuff, but it's hard to confess your sins, right? And right. um, so that, that took guts and, and I appreciated it, but um, you know, you've got, you've been in the profession. I, I mean, I started in 1985, but you've been in it quite a while. Uh, how did you get started? What made you say, Oh, you know, I'm going to go from psychology over into animal health. Well, I actually did it the opposite. I started in veterinary technology and then went to psychology. And okay. I, I will, I will confess more to why I did that, but um, back to why I wanted to be in animals is I grew up in animals, basically having, always having an animal. And I know a lot of people say that, but it was one of those things. Like, that's what I always said since I was probably five years old to my parents. I always wanted to do something. What that meant is at, well, obviously at five, I didn't know what that meant. Um, when I got into high school and I started to really explore what that meant is I wanted to be in the nursing side of the field, whatever that was. And at that time, it was just starting out as the animal health technicians. Um, wasn't like around a lot of saying that, you know, that was what I wanted to do. And when I was in high school is I was not guided towards a profession of, uh, in the veterinary field because I was not the best student. I had to really work really hard in high school to be able to get, you know, even, average grades. Um, so I was not guided by the people at the school. My parents always guided me to doing the stuff I love to do, but the people at the school did not guide me towards it. They were always saying, go to this, this field. And it was more into the professions that I'd want to be in. Um, I said that, you know, it actually was more or less the really got me to stride to make that a negative or, uh, you know, a better way to say, I want this and this is what I want and I'm going to go after it. Even if I fail, I'm going to fail on my own and not have somebody telling me that I'm going to fail. So um, it guided me to look at where I had. And we had really good vet tech schools um, here in Massachusetts. And I looked into both of them and I, you know, I was accepted to both of them. And Becker was in a smaller town and I came from a small town. So I said, well, that's what I want to go to. Cause I, it would be the first time I was away from, was away from home um, for an extended amount of time. So I really wanted to stay in that small town feeling. So that's where I went and it was a struggle, but I did it. And I was uh, happy that I was successful at that. And that, you know, moving into the field and getting to know more about the field is how my career progressed and, and really working towards what do I want to do next? What do I want to do? How do I want this to go? And, you know, like you talked about the bend and, and that type of stuff, but I had a lot of twists and turns in the, in the field. And I think that's really big on how to be successful um, and how to recover from those twists and turns mm -hmm. and be able to continue. Yeah. So think, let's think about those curveballs. What, um, looking back on your career, I mean, obviously you start out as uh, uh, LVT, I guess. We don't know because <laughs> the LVT, RVT, CVT, depending on what state you're in, but a licensed uh, technician. Um, what, um, how did your pro career progress as you were working in, you know, hospitals, get your first job, and, and then move to be a technician specialist. How did, I mean, that's, you know, that's not a, a, 
a straight path usually. Right, right. So I started off in private practice. Um, my first five years was in private practice and I was a CBT because Massachusetts is a credential tech um, state. So I started there um, and I felt that it was really important to start, um, and, and I wanna say at the bottom because it really was not at the bottom. It was working in private practice, really understanding the field at that point and be able to continue my education. And I worked with a wonderful team um, at one, the first practice and it, it was a, a growing experience. And what my, when you talk about the specialty and that type of stuff. So my next set was, I wanted to go work at Tufts University and Tufts is about five minutes from where I live now. And that was my goal. So being in private practice about three to four years in, I said, well, my next goal is working at the specialty hospital and, and being part of that education of the next generation of veterinary professionals, whichever they would be. Um, and meaning that we did have a lot of obviously vet tech students that came through for externships and stuff like that. So to be that help for that next generation. And it took me a couple of years to get in. Um, Tufts was really hard to get in at that point. And so when I did finally get in as a weekends and holiday technician, so I worked still at the private practice, worked at Tufts, and built myself up to a full-time position at Tufts. And then I finally left the private practice. Um, and that's where I found my love of specialty medicine. And um, they didn't have the roles that I was looking for. Um, so I said that, you know, can we just develop them? And that was kind of became my key to everything I did learning was starting new roles and then making them the best. So when I did leave them, no matter why I left them or what, if I left the practice or if I left uh, just the role, that I made it the best it could be. And then that, that next person could take it from there and go up. So I worked in the wards and I worked in oncology. And then my favorite, and I shouldn't even say, you no one should ever have favorites, right? But my favorite role overall was internal medicine. I had not only great mentors with the internists that were there, but I also had a lot of great uh, technician mentors through the field. Because as I started to do, like go to ACVIM and doing other stuff, internal medicine, that's when I really started to find that niche, that, that group of people that I knew that I wanted to network with to help with you know, vet tech specialty and stuff like that. And being part of the charter membership of the internal medicine um, VTS is where I really um, learned a lot more on the networking and the education and understanding that. So being that charter member is where my VTS obviously came from. And um, Linda Merrill was huge in that, um, working and building that up. And there's a, there's a group, there's a core group of people and then taking uh, internal medicine people from all over, all different specialties. And, and then of course, all through the vet, um, vet schools uh, to build up that. And, and starting from square one, you know, we had obviously guidance from other uh, specialties, but that's where that really had, and, and that's still my love. Um, you know, internal medicine will always be uh, my love, no matter if I'm working in it or not. Yeah. I, I love how you talk about setting goals because I think sometimes people fall into jobs and they don't really look towards the future. Like what is the next thing I want to do? Am I, am I satisfied being here? Do I want to learn more? Um, and, and, you know, the other time I think people expect to be spoon fed a lot of their education. And, you know, for me, um, it was available to me, but nobody said, you've got to go do it. And I, I'm like you, I just like to learn a lot of stuff. And if you could see behind me, there's a ridiculous amount of books <laughs> on the bookshelves behind me, but um, setting your goals and moving through those. Um, obviously, I mean, you really worked a long time to try to get into Tufts. I mean, that mm -hmm. was a, a couple of years and just, and then to be able to take the hit to be weekends. And, you know, basically those are the crappy shifts, right? So, right. I'm going to get in there and just do it just so I can, I can get into that goal. So sometimes you have to suffer a little bit for your goal, I think, to, to understand that and, and be willing to that. But so Mel, what's, what's been the toughest life challenge that you've had? I mean, you, you know, obviously these are very successful events in your life, but it, it wasn't easy uh, going through this. So what was the toughest thing that happened? Um, I think 
um, for, and I thought about this a lot, um, is I think my toughest years were um, a few years ago, I lost uh, a couple uh, very special souls in my life. I lost my grandmother, I lost my best friend. Um, and, and, you know, it, it really challenged me to grieve the right way to understand not why they left, but how I can move on. Um, and then I got sick myself. I had some medical issues myself. And um, I was at a point where um, with a lot of the medical issues that I was having is I just, uh, it wasn't that I didn't want to live. I didn't want to live in that condition. I didn't want to live feeling so um, horrible all the time. And it was a time of great challenge because on one part is I had to try to find help um, for those medical conditions. I had to find help for um, really the emotional impact that the losses I had were taking, were taking on me. But I also had to try to figure out if I was gonna stay in this profession because that was one of the huge biggest challenges. I love this profession and how could I continue what I was doing and be able to deal with it on a medically, because as we all know is no matter what your medical status is, this profession is very hard on your body, no matter what, especially as a veterinary technician in a, in a specialty area is that I had a really a lot to, to really work through and try to figure out. And I am one of those people that has a really hard time reaching out and finding that. And, and I learned through that was one of the big things was, is yes, you have to grieve your losses and not just hide from them. Um, and then to be able to move on from those and be able to understand, you know, where you're at and how you can. And then also on that is when you need help, you got to ask for it. Mm -hmm. I, I did not grow up in a family that therapy was a, a thing that we talked about a lot. Um, but I did find that um, having a personal coach for um, quite a few years did help be able to move me past you know, a lot of those things that were, that were holding me back. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing really well professionally and everybody saw that, that how, how I was achieving, but I was personally, I was just really struggling. And, and I think that's what I like to um, give back to the profession is how I, how I struggled to go through my journey is how can I help the next generation or that, that group of people that might need that. I was there once, this is how I did it. Doesn't mean you have to follow my journey, but you have to be proud of your own journey and advocate for yourself and really to try to say it's okay not to be okay, but it's also okay to ask for help when you need it. And, you know, to stop that stigma of any mental health that you have or any of that stuff to be able to move on. And I think that's one of the biggest curveballs that threw me because I was feeling like I was going to lose everything at that point, mm -hmm. you know, losing that huge part of my identity of being a professional in the field was um, really, really, really difficult. And I didn't want, didn't know how I was gonna say goodbye to everyone, but how I was gonna say goodbye to the profession as a whole and where I was gonna go. And um, the one thing we didn't talk about before is, yes, I already had my degree in psychology, but it wasn't, I didn't want to go into psychology. I got that degree to help myself in our profession to help others in our profession, to understand the, the psychology behind human behavior so I could understand the people I worked with and how I could actually help that, that generation of, yeah. of veterinary professionals. You know what, I, I mean, you were preaching to the choir because I, <laughs> you know, I, I so believe that so much that is wrong with our profession comes from a group of people who truly avoid humans because they like animals better. Mm -hmm. And then they get into this profession, not with an unrealistic expectation that it's all animals and not humans. And it truly is humans with animals as the product. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and when we discover that, and we discover that we can use a lot of our knowledge from the animal behavior um, this is the thing I discovered when I became fear free. I was I was going through these modules and I'm blasting through like one through seven. Man, it's behavior, behavior, behavior. And I've been studying people for 20 years. And it was all the same as human limbic brain responses. Now, when I got into module eight, it was all about medication dosage. It kicked my ass. I would tell you. Right. 
I was like, I don't know about this stuff. But if we understand that humans are having the same fear, anxiety, and stress responses that animals are when they're put into situations that cause them stress, and then we manage the fear, anxiety, and stress in the animals, we can manage the fear and anxiety in humans if right. we know, but we don't know. And so I think that is the gap in our education is, is that communication piece, the knowledge about neuroscience, the reactivity responses that humans, you know, just, we're just animals. We do, we have those responses, but we also learn to control our own responses. And that's right. one of the keys too. And that's, you know, going back to the article you wrote about bullying, one of the things that you learned to do was was look at yourself and stop your behaviors or see those behaviors as what they were and stop it. Now, did you do that after you had the psychology uh, information? Did you figure that out so, before it? Um, well, I got, finished my degree for psychology in 2000. So I think what it's been after that, yeah. that I really started to figure out. Um, and it was probably most through the coaching that I've had because I started to see myself um, and the bullying article came out of that too, but um, I really started to see myself in a different light, but I also wanted to, as I'm preaching to people or lecturing, I should say, or speaking to people and tell, you know, really saying that I'm going to hold you accountable on like, if, uh, as a manager, I'm going to hold you accountable. I have to hold myself accountable for my actions. And I think that that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize is it's, it's okay to hold yourself accountable and to say, you know, you're sorry when you do something, you know, incorrect, that we're all human. And sometimes it softens that, you know, management um, team member relationship where, you know, you really have to really look at yourself and say, how can I be better the next day? What did I do today that was a, a challenge that I, you know, thought for myself that it wasn't the right thing or whatever the case would be and to hold myself accountable and be better the next day. And, and I, and I'm not sitting here saying every single day, I'm like, Oh, I, I, I did this incorrect or whatever, but I'm big on, and I know we, again, another preaching to the choir, I, I'm big on journaling. So my big thing is I, if I journal at night and, and put down my thoughts from the day is the next day, if I feel that I didn't do something correct or, you know, that there was something there that, you know, a thought, a negative thought or a negative, um, you know, whatever the case would be, is that I'm not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And if it's in paper and, and, and pen, not pencil, paper and pen <laughs> is I did it and it's there. It's a permanent, mm -hmm. even though it's not permanent, I can throw it away, but it's a permanent thing that that's why I don't use pencil because it's something I could erase and say it was never there. And and I do think that those are important to really look. And it's not something I have to share with everyone or to sh everybody to see that um, the journaling stuff or what my thoughts are or anything that 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 factor. But it is down to it's important to hold ourselves accountable for everything mm -hmm. that we do, good, right, wrong, whatever the challenge is, and not to use the excuse it's because of the challenge or it's because of the crisis or it's because of this loss or whatever the case would be mm -hmm. is you know i've had some losses in my life i've had professional losses more than you know in the last couple of years and you know i don't hold anybody else accountable for those losses than myself and you know at first maybe i'd be like i can't believe that happened but on the other hand is what can i do better for the next time mm -hmm. that I don't fall back into that same realm. And some of them weren't my fault, but what did I do where the next time it is, I, I do better? Yeah. Well, we, you know, we all learn by failure. And one of the challenges I think in our perfectionist world of veterinary medicine is that we're afraid of making a mistake. But if you think about it from the time we we're born, all we do is fail. We fall down when we learn to walk, we crawl, we cry, we get back up, we do it again. And we learn how to balance. And then the next thing you know, we're running around the house and, and there we go. So if we never fail, we never learn. It's human, the human experience is, is learning by failure. And truthfully, it's, it's probably the only thing that's really sticky when we look at it, because we do remember this stuff. And, you know, I've said many times that as a manager, I have screwed up so many times, mm -hmm. but hopefully over 35 years, 
I learned some lessons and I can teach those lessons to others so they don't make the same mistakes. You know, they'll make their own mistakes, but they, they at least can learn from mine and not do the same things that I did. So let's talk about fear because I'm, I'm a believer that fear causes a lot of problems in our world. And sometimes just the fear of having a conversation with somebody who's upset you, we just hide and mm-hmm. we don't have that conversation. Um, fear of somebody coming in and maybe even being better than us, you know, and here, you know, if you're the top dog and you're like super tech and somebody comes in who has like you, all these, all these initials and and specialty work and, you know, actually start the VTS specialty, then that could be very intimidating to others. And I think that we are afraid to admit those things. And then that causes cultural breakdowns in hospitals you know, we're responsible for the culture and, and people always want to say, oh, it's the manager's or the owner's responsibility to build the culture, but it's everybody's responsibility to build the culture. And just like you said, taking, taking responsibility for yourself. Mm-hmm. So l- talk a little bit about fear because there's, you know, that's the, the, all these changes and all this stuff is, is very scary and going through a lot of just human loss is also very fearful. And yeah, and there's a lot of fear around everything, right? Especially what we do. And, you know, I found, you know, when, as I was advancing through my career, my fear was, you know, the comparison to the others in my brain, right? My thought process and everything else. And that was a huge, um, actually eye-opening, why am I always comparing myself to, or putting people up on a pedestal that they probably should never be on and not because they don't deserve it. It's just, why am I comparing them and and making that? But the fear that I always had was that I am not good enough for certain things. And because of, um, you know, the challenges I had early in my education where I, I struggled a lot Um, and we mentioned it earlier, but I struggled a lot in, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, and that type of stuff, where I actually had to learn that I worked twice as hard or three times as hard as some of the people that I was with, and and why was that always the case, and that impacted me throughout my career now, because it's the same way, like, I work really hard to get where I am, And, and, and to the fact of, like, I have to work twice as hard to get that next level or whatever the case would be. And, and it, the fear of failure, I think is huge to all of us. And, and I think it to the point of hiding from it and not wanting to say I failed. And, and I could say that, and I don't like the word failure per se, but I, I can say there's a lot of places where I have failed But again, like you said, it's the learning thing, right? So let's start to say, okay, I failed. So what is the next thing? What did I learn from this experience to make it so I don't feel that I failed in this? And and there's been a lot of, you know, job losses, professional losses that I feel that I probably should have challenged myself a little bit more to achieve that goal to be able to not fail as a failure. But then on the other side is, Why do I feel that I'm a failure at that? And just what did I learn? And those three things really come down to, do I, and I said this recently in a lecture that the one goal I set and I did not achieve it yet, doesn't mean it won't be achieved, but it was one of those things that I do feel that I failed at it, but do I feel, do I feel that I overcompensated to the next level of, okay, well, I didn't make this goal, but there was a higher goal to that, that I did achieve. Does that erase that earlier one? No, it's still there, but I still learn like maybe down the road, it's going to be another one. And, and recently I did have some professional losses that I do feel that I failed at what I was doing and how I was trying to achieve it. And then I kind of turned that a a little bit around and said, my biggest thing that I always want to do, if I'm in a job for six months, a year, 10 years. My biggest thing is when I leave any, any company, any organization, anything like that, I want to leave it better than it was when I got there and be a positive influence on whatever the, 
the job I have is, you know, learning and development, management, whatever it is to have that. And that's, that has changed my thought process on failure. I don't say I fail anything. I say like you do is what did I learn? And then how can I do it better? Mm -hmm. And then what are the challenges ahead of me to be able to achieve that next goal? But then I always, and I always say this kind of funny is I'm always friends with people. I, even when I leave companies or, or practices or whatever, I'm always still friends with people. And I find that that's actually a success because I wouldn't be, if I failed at the job or I failed at being positive or having that positive influence, I wouldn't find that those friendships that I did have. And I think that that's huge is keeping that network, keeping that, those, those friendly avenues open to be able to, maybe they'll be able to help me achieve that goal or that next um, thing, or they take them along like that mentor mentee relationship is huge Mm -hmm. in our field. And, you know, I see every job I've been in, I have had great mentors, um, no matter what the relationship is, I still feel that I can, you know, open the door and say, you know, this is what's where I'm struggling at, you know, what can I do to, to help achieve this? And I don't do anything on my own anymore. I, I say that there is either the guardian angel or there's somebody else in, in the human form that's going to help in one way or the other. And, and we, we're there to help each other. And I think that's really important to make sure. And, and one thing that I, I always try to put to anyone that I speak to is we need to stop comparing ourselves to others and we need to stop beating ourselves up ourselves, you know, um, and mind, body, everything that we really have to look at that imposter syndrome and stop really looking at that as I'm a failure and that person's a success. Um, the comparison is what's going to really make us all fail in the, really in the future. Yeah. Well, if you, if you look at life that there's, there's an abundance for everybody, then you don't have to compare yourself to others. You don't have to be in competition with them. You know, truthfully, I think my competition is me. I Mm -hmm. want to set those goals. I want to reach certain levels. I want to influence people to benefit them. And, and you, you just keep working on that instead of going, oh, well, you know, she got to speak at such and such a conference and I didn't, or, you know, whatever. I I don't really look at that kind of stuff uh, much. And it just, you know, I just kind of go through life doing the best I can with what I've got to work with right? and making connections with people that I think um, I want to know, because I think that's, that's huge. And, and let's talk about network a little bit, because you, you said, you know, I never burn bridges when I leave, no matter what happens, I still have those connections. And I feel the same way. I mean, you know, I was um, laid off from my job in the recession, but I still kept in contact with many of the people from the practice and uh, felt like they were still good friends. And I learned a lot from being in that practice um, that I would never have known before that I, you know, could take out into the world. How do you think networking has, you know, kind of helped you reach the goals that you set for yourself? Um, Well, on a couple of different levels. So networking is obviously you have that inner circle, um, outer circle, whatever you want to call it to help guide you through, you know, the challenges that we have in the veterinary field. And, and one thing is, is I always want to have, you know, to have that guidance inside where um, if I'm struggling on something, say management wise, I know there's people I can reach out to, to say, Hey, this is what's happening. What do you think? You know, and somebody inside the field is going to have a way better discussion about it versus somebody that's outside because they just, people that are outside and even if they're in our inner circle, our family, our friends, they don't understand the veterinary field. It's a very um, fast paced, kind of a difficult sometimes, but very rewarding field. But on the other hand is you want to have the like-minded people Mm -hmm. that can help you when you're struggling or that you have um, issues or concerns or whatever the case would be. Um, And then on the other side is they're actually in, in their own way. They don't might not know it, But they're challenging, for me, they're challenging me to that next level. Like if I look at a certain individual and say, you know, I want to do what they're doing or whatever the case would be, how would I get there? And that's how I actually, and kind of be back to the psychology degree is there was, I was at my, one of my first lectures 
ever in the field. And it was, the lecture was called Don't Kill Your Boss. And I thought, what a weird title, but I'm going to go into this one. And I, I didn't, I loved my boss at the time. So I'm not going to say it had anything to do with that, but it was a CE lecture and not, you know, obviously you had to be at those. Went up to the speaker afterwards and I was a very quiet kid at this point. Like I was not going to, I mean, I was in my twenties. I was not going to speak to anyone else. Um, I was very introverted, way different than I am now, obviously. Um, and I went up and I said, I want to do what you're doing with lecturing. And I don't even know why I even said it because I didn't know if I really wanted to. I Public speaking was nothing I ever thought I would ever do. <laughs> but I did say, like, I want to know what you did to get to this point where you're at and how I can do it. Like, I fell in love with those leadership skills, those things right away, but I didn't go into it right away. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of scared away. And, and her answer was she had her veterinary technology degree and she got her psychology degree. So I said, all right, then I guess, and I always liked psychology. So I always liked that. And that was actually where I, if I didn't go into animals, I probably would have gone into psychology. And I said, well, all right, then I'll go get that. Now, was it something that I thought I would actually achieve? Not really thought it, I just said it. And then I, you know, kind of went home and I said, well, how can I do this? And you know, I looked at the local college and they had the degree and I said, I'm going to go for it and then see what happens in the career. And I can say that, you know, I use that degree probably more than any other degree, any other certificate or anything else that I have. But it was mostly because then I understood that side of it, that that human side of it. And, you know, I, I look at anyone that's in our field and the veterinary technology side or the um you know, the management, the leadership, anybody that's in it. And I, I follow people very closely and, you know, I follow my students, see where they're going to go, but I follow people to the point of, well, if they're doing that, maybe that would be something fun to do. Now, I didn't want to have a hundred different jobs. I wanted to have something that I could find my niche in and, and really enjoy and then go after it and then just start achieving it bigger, bigger, bigger level. Mm -hmm. And I can say, even after 30 something years in the field, I still, even though I love education is probably where I'll stay, is there's a lot of different niches that I really like. I like recruiting. I think that talking to that next generation and getting them on the same path that they, that they want to go and to, to understand is, is a whole different level of understanding how our field is going to, where it is going to be in the future mm -hmm. um, and what that next generation looks like and how do we help as the veteran and those that really want to retire at some point in our careers is we want to leave the profession into good hands. Mm -hmm. And, but we have to be those people to help those guys and help guide those, those students and that, that earlier, that generation into mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we do that? And how do we keep them into that profession? And as we all know that there's a lot of struggles in our profession and those guys that are burning out is how, give them that avenue not to leave the veterinary medicine, but being able to achieve their goals, even if it isn't in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. um, but it really is that I think networking is the only way to go is yeah. to have that, you know, I look at the network I have and I don't think there's ever anyone that I didn't say I can reach out to them to you know, have A, B, and C or whatever mm -hmm. the case would be. And, and I do, I do reach out to a lot of people and say, I need a lecture on this. Can you do it for me? And, you know, it's, it's that type of stuff is one word is taking my reputation on you lecturing for me. But on the other thing is, is I know you can do a really good job of it. And I need your expertise to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's huge for all of us. And I got people doing that with me too. And, and I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I love uh, networking and I lie. I, I just like to know people. I, I'm so interested in what they do. And I'm one of those animal people who actually likes humans a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> it works out really well, but you're right. I mean, to be able to, to pick up the phone and say, you know, Hey, I have this clinic and they really need some help with like their workflows for their technicians. Could you come into this hospital and do some work or, you know, for me, you know, we, our culture is falling apart. Can you come in here and, and do something about improving the culture in our hospital? Having that, having that net, we don't have to be an expert on everything. You just need to know experts on everything. Right, right. 
And then you and I, have this great tool belt, right? That you can bring in and help people. Um, you know, and you said something that really uh, struck me and I, I really want to dig into it a little bit. And that's about the people leaving the profession that they're just kind of throw their hands up and, and walk away. And I, and like all the hospitals are toxic, but they're not. I mean, when we look at like the Merck studies, 88% of people in our profession really like doing what they're doing. And, mm -hmm. and there's a vocal number that don't or that are miserable. How can we change that narrative? Because I feel like we're creating this self-fulfilling prophecy that says this is a horrible profession and nobody wants to go into it or it's always going to be toxic or nobody knows how to behave around humans. And so we, you know, we're constantly churning through people, but, you know, I know I go into hospitals that are great. The cultures are wonderful and people are very supportive and, and they're out there and they exist. Um, what do you tell people who are, who just kind of give up? Well, I, I, I think in our profession, I think there is, um, some talk, I mean, and I'm going to say some toxicity. I think what I, I see a lot of people doing, and, and I don't know where the narrative started from and that type of stuff. I, I do think that COVID did injure us a little bit more, but I do feel that it has, this started way before COVID. It just that it was a, um, really heightened from the, the increase of pet ownership during COVID. But I do think that what I usually try to say is this is, again, like you just said, it's not a bad profession. It's a really great profession. Um, why am I have been in it for 32 years is because I can't imagine myself, even though I've had my struggles, is doing something else that, that I would get the same feeling from. Every single day I get up the same way and say, I'm going to make a difference in this, in this community that we're in and how can I do that? And I think that there is that narrative that goes around that, that every, you know, a company is toxic. And I think that that is probably where a lot of the stuff has to change is it's practice by practice. It's mm -hmm. company by company. And I mean, small companies or whatever the case would be that if there is a company that has a lot of toxicity in their practices and they're say they're a big company is that's not a surprise right it's not a surprise but it's not necessarily the the companies that is causing it it's that they may be hiding from it and not helping the issue mm -hmm. um or the people don't like the way that they're handling it and, you know and we as a generation don't say how we feel that we can fix it. Or if somebody shuts us down, we don't try to do anything more, that we don't try to find a different avenue to help the profession. And I think that as a veteran technician and a lot of my network are in the veteran side of it is how can we as a, as a group fix it? And I think that what we do as the veterinary technicians is we're waiting for someone else to fix it. We're waiting for our national organization. We're waiting for the, the or other organizations to fix it. And we are not taking that accountability ourselves. And I can hold myself accountable for that too, is we don't know how to hold our, to start that. Like, I think that there's so much, sometimes so much infighting. There's so much people butting heads. There's so much competition is that since we're always competing with each other, we're not ready to sit down at the table together. And I think that's what we have to do is as that group of technicians, the new, the new guys that are coming in, the ones that have been out five years or so, and then the veterans that have been out 20, 30, you know, 40 years, whatever the case would be, is all sit down at the table and say, how can we help the profession? Mm -hmm. How can we help these guys? Um, and I think it starts at, you know, the veterinary schools and the veterinary technology schools is setting them up for success when they walk in, giving them, and some of them do it well and some don't, is giving those them those skills to be able to go out into the profession and say, I understand what is happening, you know, with burnout, with compassion fatigue, or whatever that case would be with the toxicity and the negativity, how can I be a better influence on that? And you know, I was a negative influence on some of the practices I was at. And I knew that is how do I become a better person to be about more positive in this practice, to be able to help this practice move on. And 
again, I was in some hard practices, some really challenging ones. And I, I said, well, one, I had to fix it. I had to be that person to fix it. And I think that I'd never look to the team to be the team to fix it, mm -hmm. not for me to be the individual. And I think that that's really important that I always look at it. And I say this to my students all the time. And I say it to the people I lecture to is one practice at a time. Can we fix one practice at a time? If you're struggling, how do you get help for your practice? Mm -hmm. Who do you look to? Is it your network? Is it the people? They're at conferences for a reason. They want to be able to improve. And, you know, I, I steer them towards people that, like we said already in the network, is those experts that, you know, this practice is really struggling with their culture. Who's the best person to help with that? Mm -hmm. um, and it is not, maybe it's not me. And maybe I don't have the, you know, the bandwidth to do it because I'm doing too many things over here is, can I reach out to this person to say, hey, this, this practice is really struggling with these things. Do you have the bandwidth or do you know somebody that would? And I think that that's where we really can help each other is stop competing for everything um, and really say, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. um, and I think those words do go a long way. Um, I understand you're struggling. Let's talk through it. Um, and I don't want to ever tell somebody that they should leave and go to another practice mm -hmm. because if they're struggling with mental health issues, if they're struggling with toxicity, if they're struggling with that, they one might be the reason for it in their own, you know, mind mm -hmm. mindset. But on the other side is I'm just sending them maybe to another practice that would have it. Like, let's figure out exactly what the thing is. Maybe one practice at a time, maybe one person at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really important that way is I don't know how to stop people from leaving the profession other than talking to them about journey and what is your journey and where is the struggle and how do we help you with that mm -hmm. struggle? And, and I feel horrible when somebody says that they're leaving and that type of stuff. And I see it all the time on yeah. social media. And, and I do feel that you know, there might be a better practice for them. Um, and I always tell them about, you know, the, the team members that I had that were toxic in one practice, but they, they really thrived in the next practice. And, and that does happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, the culture might not be the best for that person, that same personality and stuff like that. And I do feel, you know, starting at the veterinary technology side or the vet, the veterinary school side, but on the other side is, is we really have to, as you know, somebody that does recruiting is really look at the personality of the person and don't throw them into the wolves. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side is if you have, and I think this is probably one of the best things for a practice to have is really to have an onboarding and, and to be able to really onboard somebody the right way. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're just, and I've, this has happened in my career and it's time that we stop doing it is if you're saying, okay, here's the first week, this is what you're going to have, but you know what? We don't have time to train you here, <laughs> yeah. get onto the floor. Yeah. And, just and that's a there. really hard thing to navigate through. And if you're somebody that struggles through your skills and your knowledge base is you're, that's why people are leaving, okay. you know, they're not set up for success and they're really are set up for failure. And mm -hmm. we have to, as a, as a field to stop doing that. And well, you know, you've, you've done a lot of training in your life and I've done the same thing. And one of the things I hear from practice owners and managers is we don't have time. Mm -hmm. And I've always believed that you make time for what you believe is important. So if you think that, you know, doing surgery is important, my goodness, you seem to make time for that. If you think that, you know, taking the money to the bank at night is important, you certainly make time for that. So if you believe that training is important, then you will commit and make time for it. Right. Because otherwise you are throwing people into the wolves and you are setting them up for failure. And, and that is uh, very unfair. Uh, that that's right. what gets to me is my sense of fairness is completely upset when we throw people into a sink or swim situation and believe me that's how I was trained I mean right. my I walked in and, and I had a four-year degree in animal science so I had some background right I knew some stuff but to walk into an animal hospital as a part-time receptionist and have the office manager say 
I am sick of training people. We have so much turnover here because you won't pay anybody because it was a minimum wage job. Then I'm not training anybody else. And so it was on me to you know, learn. And fortunately, I was very eager to learn. And I had people skills experience. And at that time, we didn't have to learn a computer system because it was paper chart. Right. <laughs> Things were, there was some simple times back there where it was you know, pretty easy. And, and all you did was talk about fleas all day. So, you know, there was no, nothing but Adam's flea spray and prednisone. You know, it's complicated now. And, and mm -hmm. I, I've always said, wow, how hard it is to walk into a, a practice because our advancements compared to 30 years ago when we walked in are incredible. I mean, we're doing MRIs and kidney transplants and that's, you know, it's big, complicated medicine. Uh, and it takes a lot to learn that and to throw somebody into that is completely unfair. Uh, I actually have on my website an onboarding document that starts mm. a month before people even come. I mean, if they're an associate veterinarian, good grief, help them find a home, help them find childcare, help them know where in town it's safe for them to live, what's the good school districts they want to live in. Um, you know, get them hooked up with the real estate agent. There's so much that you can do to make people feel welcome before they, that first day when they walk in the door, have their business cards ready. I mean, have right. them somewhere to work, a desk. Um, I've, I've walked into a hospital as the chief operating officer and had nowhere to work. You know, yeah. uh, I, they sit here behind the front desk, maybe you can work here. So then, you know, we have to build an office. So, you know, be prepared for people um, appropriately and then walk them through even stuff like how do I clock in and out and where am I supposed to park? How do I get a pen and where's the bathroom? I mean, we don't right. even do that kind of simple stuff that leaves people floundering from the first day. And, and so they're just lost immediately. But, you know, onboarding appropriately is a huge indicator of longevity. They right. will stay if right. you onboard them correctly and train them appropriately uh, and always give them opportunities and education. Solving problems together is huge. And, you know, you said, you know, I thought, you know, as the manager, I think I have to fix these things. I've always believed in hiring smart people and mm -hmm. use all the brains on your team and, and say to the people, right. here's the problems that we have let's talk about what we can do because the people who are doing the work know how to fix the problems, but nobody right. ever asks them or listens to them. Right. I or, mean, I, I, you know. the funny thing is, is I had a, a recent um, in the last couple of months is I had an interview um, that that was what my boss told me, like the interviewee, which turned out to be my boss uh -huh. after that um, was, you know what? I hire people, smart people with their own expertise and all I do is expect them to do their job and to the best of their ability. I'm here if you need me, but otherwise I will not be talking to you again unless there's some um, concerns or issues that have come to my attention. And it's like, you know, when you have that and you feel that you are actually valued in, in a position, I think that's huge. And I, and I do think there are, and I don't want to make it all negative, I do think that there are our profession is getting better about that, mm -hmm. but yet there are still those struggles with, um, you know, people getting into the profession. And, and I do think setting people up, no matter what way they come in is um, the success is where it's going to be. And then, and to value them and to give them a, prof you know, a professional growth path will be how you're going to keep them in the mm -hmm. profession, no matter what. And as I was early in my career and I set those goals for myself, as we started talking about it from the beginning is maybe we don't have to be the individuals that have to do it is our groups, our internal um, management should be able to say, these are the goals I'm looking for you to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe, and I had places that did this, is there any ones that you can think of that you would like to achieve yourself? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we were set up, especially Tufts was big at that, is we were set up every six months of what is the next goal that you want to achieve professionally, not pro personally, but professionally. Mm -hmm. And then so give us some goals that you want to set up personally and, you know, within this to be able to get to that next level. Mm -hmm. And, and it was always something that, you know, I set from little kid all the way up is, you know, those goals. And, 
And it's big to be able to give that to that next, you know, set and say, how do we help you achieve what you want? And I think that's what we have to do mm -hmm. in our profession. Yeah. Yeah. If, if people are feeling like they're in a dead end job and they're stagnating and that there is no hope in sight, then I can see why they jump ship. You know, the, but right. for, for me, for you, there was always the next big thing. We're always looking for the next big thing. Um, and, and there are challenges to that kind of like some people can't move. Some people have restrictions as to, you know, where their spouse or significant other is working and they can't move. But I, I remember many years ago, somebody said, if you want a job, you know, you'll be staying where you are. If you want a career, you've got to be willing to right. take those leaps and move and do stuff outside of, and some are very, very much so outside of your comfort zone. Right. Um, and, and as women, we're very bad about, you know, taking those risks because, I remember reading this and you, I know, you know, it too, Mel, is that um, a, a woman will look at a description, like maybe LinkedIn has a job out there and she goes, well, you know, these are 10 qualifications and I have eight, I'll get the other two and then I'll go apply. And a man will go, well, you know, I have five of the qualifications. I'm going to go apply and I'll figure right. out the rest of it. And we need to be brave. We need to go, you know, for it. Um, and figure it out as we go. Cause you know what we're, we will, we're smart. We can do it. We can't do it as well as anybody else who, who is out there doing the same thing and trying for it too. We, we just have to talk to ourselves a little bit. And I, I believe that one of the best things you can learn to do is talk to yourself appropriately. Mm -hmm. And this is what coaches teach us to do, right? They teach us to get out of our, our fearful limbic brain and say, hmm, take a breath here. Let's look at this with the smart part of your brain and, and diagnose it and figure out and move forward, um, you know, to get, to reach your, your new goal. So Mel, tell me if you were going to help somebody, you know, with a, a life goal or a career decision, and you do that all the time because you're recruiting, um, what advice do you give them when they are trying to figure out what their next step is? Um, well, everybody has an individual journey, right? So what my, and I, I try to do this, I have a, a mentee that has followed my career um, for a long time, and she, she's kind of following my path a little bit. And I, and I said to her one time, I'm like, you know what, have your own journey. I, and I don't mind if you look at mentors and say, this is what they have to do, and I'm going to follow that. Maybe there are stuff that you want to, and I, and I do that too. But I always say one is always thinks outside the box, like stop putting ourselves into that like box, like this is what we have to do. And I have never had a box. And I always laugh because people are like, how do you think outside the box? I'm like, think outside the box. I've never been in a box. And I always thought like, I'm either going to achieve my goals or not going to achieve my goals, but I'm not going to have anything that's going to be a roadblock per se to those goals. But one is think outside the box, advocate for yourself, look at what your journey is and what do you really want to do? What do you personally want to achieve going forth? And, and if somebody says, I like animals and I don't like people and that's why I want to work in animals, that doesn't work. Mm -mm. What do you want to do? Where have you like researched enough of, or even when you were in school, enough of understanding what the field is, you know, it's not just working on animals or working with animals. Um, there are people attached to that and we know it. There's a people you work with every day and, and it's not that fight the thing is always look at what your journey is. You're going to have twists and turns. How do you achieve your goals? Even with those twists and turns, you know, if I'm driving a car and I have, and you say the bend, right. If I have to continue to drive, and there's a bend in the road, do I keep going straight and fall off the cliff? Or do I kind of go along with the bend and figure out what the next part of that journey is? And I think that's really important to always look at what is the next goal that I'm looking at? And then where I am now, how am I going to achieve that? And always look at, again, be kind to yourself through that journey is if you fail at what you think is a failure, might be a lesson learned and maybe to move on and to stop. One thing is I am, I am also one that's very loyal to places that I've been. And again, I try to leave places more positive than I found them. And they could be a really positive 
uh, place, but I want to bring in my positivity too, and then leave them, um, you know, in, in a good sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really important to never burn bridges, no matter what you feel like is if you're working side by side to a technician or a veterinarian, or you're in a vet school, you're in a tech program or whatever the case would be, is they may be your bosses around the corner. <laughs> and I've had that where, you know, I've gone into companies as learning and development, recruiting, whatever it could be. And the head person is a, you know, a, a veterinarian that I taught at, you know, at Tufts or something like that. And, and, you know, I always look at that is like, how can I help you? I'm never going to be somebody to be like, this is my journey and you have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, but it really is that I feel like this next generation needs to really advocate for themselves and they need to be able to have a voice. And if you're not having a voice, and I was one that always hid my voice, but if you're not able to verbalize what you want, then you need to figure out how to do that, mm -hmm. either through coaching, through other people, through networking, whatever the case would be, is you need to have find your own voice. Mm -hmm. And that's so important in our generation. I mean, in our profession now mm -hmm. is being able to voice and verbally say, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I want, especially in practices is if somebody's, you know, treating you poorly is say, that's not okay. Right. You know, exactly. and sit down. And I know we talked about fear is nobody wants to have those conversations. Nobody wants to say stuff. And it's like, if I'm having a problem with you, I'm going to sit down and say, you know what, Deb, I heard A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. How can we come to a better working relationship? You don't have to love everybody you work with. Yeah. You don't actually even have to like them. You have to respect them. They have to respect you. And you have to work as a team to achieve the goal of patient care and client experience. First and foremost, that's, that's our always should be your number one goal. Um, all that little stuff should be away from the world around us. And if you, if it isn't, then we should be able to sit down and have those crucial conversations around what is not is not part of our our goal uh, professionally and personally. And I, it, it's hard to do. It's not easy. But the fact is, is that if we don't do it, we're going to continue to beat ourselves up for not doing it. Exactly. And it's going to clear our minds and have honestly better working relationships. Mm -hmm. And the respect factor will be there oh, yeah. if we start to actually have those conversations. And I know you talk about it all the time and all the lectures you do on management and leadership and stuff, but I don't think that we're doing it per se the way, and I don't mean the people mm -hmm. lecturing on it. It's yeah. the people inside the practices oh, that like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to have to sit down and do that. Yeah. And I only learned to do that when I was a manager and yeah having those times when you can stay calm and have those conversations. And if you feel like there's times when you start to get a little heated or getting stressed out or whatever, feel that it's okay to pause yeah. and say, you know what, I need to take a break and regroup and then come back to it. And, and I think that's important to recognize that all around. Um, but I do feel that management has to also recognize that take their head out of the, some of them have to take their head out of the sand and recognize that there is some, negativity, some toxicity, some problems, there's some concerns in the practice and that we need to, or the company, wherever you're working and be able to say, how can I fix it? Or how can I get, you know, the team to be part of this supportive team, collaborative team to fix what is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's one, important. One of the things that you mentioned was talking about like goal setting and stuff, but I think it's also really important that people look at their own purpose. Like, what do you want to do in your life? And when you look back, like if you were going to write your own obituary, what would, what would people write about you? You know, what, do you want to look back and say that there was positive things written about you and that you made a difference, a good difference, but having your own core values, because mm -hmm. when we have our own core values, we can look at, you know, maybe the opportunities come up and maybe they look bright and shiny and, you know, maybe there's a lot of money to it, but then they don't meet our core values. And so when we go into that job, no matter how lucrative it might be, we never are happy there. 
because we can't be because it's it's against our nature to do it and and maybe against our purpose in life uh, to do that. So I think we have to we have to know ourselves well and sometimes that comes with age. You know, nobody teaches you how to do that at 20. They should. That's some, one of the things that really should be teaching you to do is what are your values out there in the world and then how to live those because when you ever are are out of value then you do tend to become the toxic person because you're unhappy. Right. And things are going against your nature. And that's always a struggle. And, and I think when you said something about some people thrive in one hospital and they don't in another, there's the real reason is because the core values are out of alignment in that first hospital. Um, I, I wrote a blog one time about, you know, having a garden. I love flowers and gardening. Mm-hmm. And stuff. Sometimes you'll plant stuff in a garden and it just doesn't thrive. There's no reason for it. It's just not the right sunlight, the right soil, whatever. And then I can take that and move that to another spot in the yard and it does great. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's about being in the right garden and then the right soil for you and knowing yourself enough to say, no, you know, this is, this is not where I'm going to thrive. You know, if, especially if you're working in a practice that's Maybe it's super busy and that's not the way you want to roll. You like a methodical approach to everything. But then there are other people who love the organized chaos. And so they need to be in a practice that that works for them. Otherwise, they're going to get bored. So that knowing yourself part of this is huge. And I think that's one of the things that we fail miserably in our just our education system that and teaching people to communicate difficult conversations. Right. You mentioned crucial conversations and you know, it's one of my very favorite books. I talk about it all the time. I believe everybody ought to be reading it at least once a year and taking the lessons to heart because we need to step into difficult conversations, quit telling ourselves false stories that people are going to be mad at us, that this is going to blow up and fall apart but we need to know how to gracefully have them. And that's the challenge is you can go and be this accuser that says you're always mean to me, or you can gracefully say, can I share my feelings with you? When we had, when you said this to me, it made me feel this way. I'm really uncomfortable with that. And I'd like to talk about it because people, I don't think, I believe in assume, assume positive intent at all times. Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't think people intentionally go out to be mean. Maybe later on after they're, they're exasperated enough, maybe they do. But at first, no. And if we could stop it right then, if we can nip it in the bud and, and catch these things like when they first happen, because often we wait too long until the toxicity builds up and it becomes so overwhelming that it has pervaded the entire place. But it's very right. much like I always used to say it was like trying to housebreak a puppy when these squats, that's when you catch him, not after he's peed on the rug 40 times. It's right. too late, right? It's right. too late to fix that. You need a new rug. Um, well, Mel, I do want to ask you, other than the Crucial Conversations book, do you have a favorite book that you would recommend? Um, I actually like it, and people laugh at me all the time, but I like the book. It's called Back to Human. Um, and I can't remember the author, but it's back to human. And it's actually, I mean, it's a human book. It's a human leadership book. It's a human business book. Um, But it actually talks about technology kind of ruining um, social media, ruining um, the world around us, right? We're, we're more on our devices than we are with our families and stuff like that. And I think COVID changed a little bit of that. We got back to the family values, but I was on a, a trip to, Western one time, and it was when um, Shroom, the human um, HR group, was on our flight. And I was sitting side by side to this wonderful gentleman. And I'm one of those people that gets on the flight, I put my earbuds on, and I want no one to talk to me. And we were on our way to Vegas. So um, he's, we started talking and, and he was talking, as I had my head my buds in and I was like, I don't want to talk. I know he's talking to me, but I don't want to talk to him. Um, but I did. And it was actually one of the best conversations I've had in a long time over, um, the suicide rate in both human and, um, in human medicine and in animal medicine. And I don't even know why we started talking about it. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't. And he said, he 
recommended this book and I, I got to Vegas and I said, all right, I'm going to get it on my Kindle and see what it, it's all about. And honestly, I'm addicted to it. And I am one that when I have to kind of bring back us to a normalcy, and I, I, I always talk about it in all the lectures I do, because I think that, I mean, it is more business than anything, but it really does um, give us the, the understanding of human behavior and why we do certain things that we do and, and how we actually are replacing human relationships with technology. And you talked about it earlier about having technology as, as a core area in veterinary medicine, and it is, but kind of looking at um, replacing those, I mean, take, getting, coming back to the family values, coming back to the networking, coming back to, you know, coming back to the conferences and actually sitting down with people and having fun yeah. and talking to people about your concerns, you know, the fun things, the challenges you have, but also the fun that we have in networking and putting away the phones and having, I, I mean, I hate, and I won't do it, but I hate having conversations with people. And all of a sudden they take out their phone and they start, and it's like, is, am I that boring? Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other side of that is one thing that I like, and that's my business book to go to. Mm -hmm. um, I do like Amy Newfield's new management book. I do like a lot of crucial conversations, that book. I do like a lot of those, um, but I am one that if I wanna get away from the veterinary world, I am a Lisa Gardner fan, a huge fan. And she has one book a year and she puts it out and usually I read it really fast and then I'm you know, hoping for another one. But I just started reading and I'm on it. I listen to tapes more than I actually uh, read them, but Dolly Parton's new book, Oh yeah, uh -huh. um, Run Rose Run, uh -huh. addicting. So if you want something that's just a fun book, um, that can get you away from that leadership or those kind of veterinary medicine books mm -hmm. is um, it's a fun book to look, you know, I'm a murder mystery or a mystery kind of person. So yeah. I, I do get away from life that way. Uh -huh. um, and those are my three kind of, you know, words of wisdom yeah. to get back yeah. to the world, back to human. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa Gardner, if you're a murder mystery kind of person, it's all based out of Boston. Um, so it's kind of, and it's all animal related. Her last book had a veterinary technician in it. So, oh my gosh. um, so it was really, it, it kind of brings it back to even human, I mean, um, the animal world, because she does a lot of things with Boston PD and stuff like that. Um, so I, I really look at those genres to, to like look at and, and cool. to learn from. All right. Now, so the fun question is, do you have Something people would be surprised to know about you, a secret talent, do you sing, do you play the piano, do you dance, tap dance, what do you, do you have a secret? I don't really have, I'm a very open book, you know that, um, I, I, I don't have a super talent per se, um, I can say a few years ago, and, and, and people, some people know this and some people don't, I, I don't talk about it a lot. But a few years ago, I had a, a friend that was getting married. So I went and got my online marriage certificate thing. Um, so I could actually marry. I did not end up marrying them because uh, they they had it a little bit different uh, way. But I do have that. Um, I'm not licensed anywhere right now, but I actually could um, license myself in a state and, and marry people if you I can, wanted to you can perform I, weddings. So yes. That's... Yes. Um, so that's I did great. do that, uh, a few years ago, that was something way outside the box that I said, I want to do to, to have it. Um, but I never, I never used it. I never really kept it up or anything like that, but that was something fun that I said I was going to do. Yeah. So it kind of, again, came back to that, like, it kind of on the human side is how I understand people in, in a different yeah. sense that way too. Um, I love it. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm huge open book. People yeah. can ask me anything and I will talk about my journey, but that I did have a lot of superstitions as a child that I try to work through. But uh, the one thing I do a lot of, and, and I just started talking about this uh, recently, just a couple, like last month is every time I lecture, and right before I lecture, I took, I, I listened to Uptown Funk um, <laughs> and I make it, so I listen to it enough that it changes whatever mindset. So I want to get into the best mindset I can, because I feel that for anything, that audience, those attendees deserve the best of me to come forth. And I think that, that song 
helps me get through that. So whenever I do anything that is an uncomfortable situation, you know, public speaking has not always been a forte of mine. Again, um, I still get nervous about it. Um, if I'm going into an interview, if I'm going into anything, I listen to that beforehand. It gets me into a better <laughs> mindset and I go forth and I feel like if I don't do it. And the other thing is, is I always have a Mountain Dew or a diet Mountain Dew <laughs> as I lecture. Those two things are very yeah. important for me to have the mindset to yeah. go forth. Everything, on everything, ramp it up the energy yes. whether with caffeine and Mountain Dew and yep. up, down, fuck. I love that. That is, yep. that is hilarious. So the next time I see you come up onto the, to lecture and I'm going to get, uh-huh. uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> She's got they, they will never see me without the video, the camera, the earbuds in walking huh. into the room. <laughs> and, and that's why. And then on the other side is there's always a Mountain Dew some way in my in my hands. And I had one, even the funny thing is, is when I was at a lecture, they didn't have Pepsi products in the, in the store that I was at. And I asked the front desk if I, uh, if they had Pepsi products anywhere around there that I could just walk to the store and get, cause I could not do the lecture without it. Um, <laughs> and they, they called the kitchen and the guy came out with a, um, a little bag, like a, like it was a, like a little, um, present bag, right? Uh -huh. One of the gift bags, uh -huh. really tiny. It looked like from, um, it was blue. And I was like, oh my God, what is this well, guy? And he hands it to me. Yes. <laughs> and he hands it to me and he goes, here you go. Enjoy your lecture. And I was like, oh, okay. I, and I opened it up and it was a Mountain Dew. A Mountain and I was like, Dew. that was, that was, and it was funny. Cause I, I told them at the front desk, this is why I need it. Like, I just need to go get it. And I had plenty of time and uh -huh. it was, and it was like, you know, it was a good conversation starter, but on the other hand is that's when I started really talking about why I use symbols. And I think that's important for all of us to remember is we can always have a symbol that will help us kind of gather ourselves and have a little bit more courage going into something. And that's where my, my symbols come from. Yeah. Is, I totally is, love is that. I totally love that. And probably I got to find a song now that, that kind of pumps me up. Cause I, you know, it's um, 2023, I'll be the keynote speaker at all the Fetch conferences, and these uh -huh. are going to be my first keynote, so I'm thinking, mm, I got to have a good walk-in song, so you know, I'll be thinking a little uptown funk. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I you know, did, yeah. actually, my professional song that I've used throughout my career is um, Don't Kill My Stride by Gene Wilder. I don't know the real name of the uh -huh. song, but it, it's, it was back in what, even the seventies or eighties, or and I don't want to date myself, but I think it was the eighties. My mother used to love it. My uh -huh. grandmother loved the song. So I heard it a lot and it's been one that I needed to do my own journey. So this was one is don't hand, don't stand in my way. Let me just stride through, thrive through whatever the case would be. And I listen to that a lot when I get down on myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but on, for me to walk into a lecture, it's totally different. That is something that I had to do. And, and, and I'm part of ABMA and they used to do open up all their committee me meetings, wherever their committee meetings were is what is your song mm -hmm. that you walk in every mm -hmm. year it needed to be a new song. And my first one that I, my first committee meeting was Uptown Funk, just because I knew the song and I'm not, I'm not a good music person. So I don't know songs really well. Mm -hmm. So that was one that was a, 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 just a good mindset changing song to me. And mm -hmm. it gave me, it had nothing to do with what the words were. It yeah. was the beat. It's the energy, and, it's the yeah. energy of the beat. Yep. Yeah, I, lo I love that. That's, that is hysterical. And you know, and it's true. I mean, songs, music can change your entire mood. Uh, yeah. I do have to say one other thing that you do. You are putting some of the funniest stuff on Facebook <laughs> Uh, some of your, 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 I mean, are you creating these memes? You are, you are cracking me up. We, you know, I, I looked at it as in, and I have, you know, somebody that we work together with uh, to do it. But on the other side is one thing that's really important to me is to bring positivity where I can. And I do feel like most of my network that is on Facebook or my social media network is veterinary professionals one way or the other, or somebody that's attached to animals one way or the other. And I think that it's so important to bring that positivity because I think in social media, it's so negative. Mm -hmm. So if I can make somebody smile and somebody laugh on a, on a daily basis, um, 
I, I try to do it. And I think that it's so important. And as I work with, you know, my PR person to help work through those, um, it really does come down to is how can we do it to, you know, better the profession or better the world around us. And, you know, I look at people the same way. It's like, I see somebody that posts something, even if they're posting something that they're, they're sitting by the, the water, enjoying that. It's like, that's a great memory to have. And I think we have to look at it as obviously it's their memory. It's not ours, mm -hmm. but like say something positive about that. Not like, you know, oh, I wish I was there and you're having a better life than I am or whatever yeah. the case would be is where, again, it's back comparison. to that comparison yeah. of why are we comparing? Like I look at somebody's child and say, oh my God, that's really cute. Here, here's a picture of my cat dressed in that outfit uh -huh. or dressed in an <laughs> outfit. And I want you to enjoy yeah. her you know, the same way or mm -hmm. whatever the case would be. And I, and I think that it's important to have fun, to uh -huh. laugh at yourself, um, to have humor in every single day. And, and if you're not, that's, what's going to cause a lot of that stress and burnout and compassion fatigue. And, and if you're not going to enjoy life, what good is having it? And exactly. I, I'm using social media the way it's intended to be. Yes. It's not to, the negativity that's around it. Right. I love it. Just spread some cheer. Well, I can remember when I first started working at the animal hospital, I, I'm a pretty happy person. I was just walking down the hall and I was smiling. My boss is, he was a grump, you know, at first he got better after I made, after I managed his practice, he got a lot better, but he looked at me and said, what the hell are you smiling about? And I said, lack of damn sense, I guess. And I just kept on walking, you yeah. know, and he just kind of went like, what? <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, why not? Yeah. And I learned from you at one of your lectures, I learned from you is to walk in the front door as a manager, mm -hmm. walk in the front door for many reasons. Obviously one is to see how your clients are seeing, you know, mm -hmm. but it's also to spread the joy as you're walking through the door is, you know, saying hi to the people, calling them by name. If there's something that they're challenging with, or there was some good event in their life or whatever, asking them about it. And that was, I always strive to do that mm -hmm. in every single place that I worked, that I was a manager in. And there was, you know, seven or eight years that I was managing different practices. And, and it did, I did, I tried to do that. And they, and they hated me for it. I, I will say that they hated me for it. Cause they, at first they were like, are you judging us every time you walked in? And, you know, as a manager, if I walked in and a, you know, a, you know, animal, peed on the floor or whatever, mm -hmm. I'd pick up the towels and clean it up. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, I'd be like, Oh, by the way, Sally, right. this is show. here. It's, I would clean it up. So it was also that side of it. Like if I was okay doing it, then everyone else should be able to, mm -hmm. okay to do it. Our clients should not be doing that. No, it's okay for us to get a, 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 around and it shouldn't be any, anybody, no matter who their title is mm -hmm. to do it. And I think that that was always important. And, and as I walked through, I knew every single person's name and I walked through with a smile on my face, no matter how much I was struggling on the backside. Mm -hmm. If I came, you know, I might've had just had a fight with somebody or whatever the case would be or argument with somebody. And it was that type of thing is like, it was important. And I, and I learned that, you know, in our field, like that's mm -hmm. so important to learn that from people that have that expertise and that have that journey and say, it's okay to, you know, smile. Yeah. And the same thing was, I always hated to hear that expression is like, why are you smiling? What, what happened? Why are you so happy? It's like, because I'm a happy person. Right. Like, let's, I'm, let's not alive. beat around kidding? it. Yeah. I'm walking like, here and right. healthy and alive. Yeah. Right. There's a lot to smile about. Absolutely. Right. You know, and smiles are contagious. Um, yes. That's the other thing too. And I'm just reading again, the book, this book called Influencer. And it's by the same people who wrote Crucial Conversations. And we really are influenced by the people around us. And so if you want to manifest change with people, what you have to do is create a culture that's the culture that you want. And, mm -hmm. and then people hold each other accountable in that culture. And that's, again, going back to those crucial conversations, it's hard to do because if people are not living up to the core values, then it's everybody's job to call them out and say, you're better than that. You really right. are better than that. Um, well, Mel, <laughs> we've talked so long. Um, I really appreciate your time. And, you know, we could talk about this forever. Um, so thank you very much for, you know, all you're doing for our profession. Um, you're, I know you're working for a company, but you're still training, um, you know, outside. It's still lecturing outside. So we'll put your, uh, comp, uh, I'll get it out there in a minute. Put your company information in the show notes so that people can reach out for training from you. 
And um, I really appreciate your time today. And thank you for all the words of wisdom. And I will look forward to seeing you next conference. Yes, when we go back to our conference family, the, the people out there don't know that we really have conference family. And, and when we go back to these conferences, <laughs> All the speakers are in the speaker's ready room and we're like, oh, it's like a family. Yeah, for us. I can't, I actually can't wait. Like, I can't wait to that. We're, I mean, we're back in normal and there's back a lot of stuff, but it's, it's fun to be able to get back to the norm of yes. seeing everyone. And, and I want to thank you for inviting me. I, this was a wonderful conversation and, you know, it, nothing that I didn't expect with you. We, ha <laughs> we always have a great conversation and we always have a lot of laughs together and I, and I appreciate you. Um, and I appreciate what you're doing for our, our profession because have it, bringing in that expertise on the leadership side is so important to be able to continue to bring that. Forward. Well, we'll just, we'll just keep chipping away at it. That's right. We're done. That's, right. That's all we can do. All right. All right. Thank you again, Mel. Thank you. Take care. Have a you great day. Are.